Welcome back to Historical Context. Today, we continue through our Colonization of New England unit, and we've been talking the last several weeks about Plymouth, and today we continue with Plymouth starting in the spring of 1622. Now, today's episode is a little interesting because Plymouth starts to face some problems, and it's people-related problems. And you would think, well, somebody within the colony is causing trouble or natives are coming in and causing issues. But in fact, it uh, actually has to do with an individual coming over from England. So the spring of 1622 comes and the Plymouth colony is newly fortified and seeming to have a permanent presence now in New England. I think it's fair to say at this point things are looking up for the Plymouth Pilgrims. They have been there now just a little longer than the failed colony at Popham, which is the first episode in this unit that I encourage you to check out. And things seem to be going much better. They had a great harvest last fall. They got through the winter seemingly well. And they planned an expedition to trade with the Massachusetts tribe. But then they heard rumors from a guide named Habamak, who we've talked about before, that they had allied with the Narragansetts, who had been threatening the colony with violence for some time now. Despite the rumors, a delegation of ten set out and they were approached by a terrified member of Squanto's family, not far from the colony, who reported he was being pursued by an allied tribe. The story ended up being not true, and the expedition went forward having a good meeting and a good trade with the Massachusetts tribe. Now compare the handling of this information with, you know, the Plymouth Pilgrims in a situation where there's possible threat versus the Jamestown settlers. It seems like the P Plymouth Pilgrims were first to think about things a little bit more versus an emotional reaction. And, uh, and it, but it's also important in, as we look at these two to think about the food supply at the time. Jamestown got off to a bad start with its natives, and that was likely due to the fact that food was far more scarce in 1608-1609 than it was in Plymouth in 1621-1622. But I think it's important as we study both of these to kind of look at the comparisons of that information, and it may give us some insight as to how those outcomes were different. Bradford goes on to kind of underhandedly uh, criticize Squanto, saying that he was playing a game with some native tribes, using the English to control and intimidate ally tribes. It appears as if the ruse may have been up on Squanto, though... Bradford notes that Squanto had become more attached to staying close to the English. And essentially what that is meaning, Squanto appears to have been intimidating some tribes and, and basically saying to them that something is gonna, bad is going to happen to them if they don't fall in line with the English, but doing it to get personal gain. Squanto and uh, Habamak actually had a rivalry between them, and the English used that to gain better intelligence. That's according to William Bradford. A little complication going on there in terms of Squanto's relationship, Habamak's relationship. It's, it's interesting to read those things, and uh, so Bradford not totally glowing on Squanto and feeling like the English presence is being used for his personal gain. In late May, and this is 1622, a small boat appears off the coast, and it turns out to be from a larger ship out to sea, commanded by a Thomas Weston. The seven men on the shallop brought a letter addressed to the late Governor Carter, written by Mr. Weston. In it, 
Thomas Weston does not offer any supplies, but states that he was associated with the Cushman trip that supplied the colony and that he would like the colony to provide him with extra supplies. Bradford, already familiar with Thomas Weston, as uh, several letters had come to the colony about him, and these were letters of caution. One letter stated that Weston was not allowing correspondence to be received by others on his ship and that his brother, whom he sometimes delegates to, is a violent and angry man. One letter warns that Weston will attempt to steal from the colony under the guise of being from the Leiden contingent of Puritans, that's the Puritans in Netherland, despite having himself severed ties from them. Another letter written by Robert Cushman, we uh, dealt with him last week, from back in England, confirmed that Weston broke away from them after a disagreement and that Weston was planning to start his own colony in New England. Cushman expressed concern that this group would not have as good a standing of relations with the natives as they had had. So Weston coming to the New World and doing his own thing may be seen as, oh, that's fine. But Cushman saying if they treat the natives poorly, that could be a problem. Cushman advised Bradford to warn Squanto of their arrival and have him communicate that warning to other native tribes. It's pretty clear here, even though he doesn't say it, that they want to immediately disassociate themselves from him when he gets there. And I shouldn't say they and it's in the pilgrims, I should say Cushman and the people writing these letters. They're sending a lot of warnings. John Pierce of the Pierce Patent writes a letter advising Bradford to quote, not let your own colony be contaminated. And he calls Weston so inferior that he is unfit for an honest man's company. And it turns out that uh, Thomas Weston was on the run. In March of 1622, he was supposed to deliver a cannon to New England, but instead he sold it to Turkish pirates and pocketed the money. And it's just, it's interesting to hear this. So this guy basically is embezzling, if, if you look at it that way. Despite all of the warnings, Bradford allows Weston's men into Plymouth, where they stay temporarily before moving to their new colony at the Massachusetts Bay, which is to the north. Weston leaves his sick men to be tended at Plymouth, while he tries to establish this colony. While Weston is gone, another letter arrives from Captain Huddleston informing the Plymouth colony of the massacre at Jamestown. So you've got this issue with Weston and you got to keep your eye on him because clearly you're hearing a lot of problems and, and Bradford apparently still wants to help uh, Weston or wants to help his fellow Englishmen, so he brings him in. But now you get this letter that there's been a massacre at Jamestown, so the colony shifts focus, and they spend the summer building a fort. Bradford mentions the uh, Jamestown massacre and the local native threat as direct reasonings for this fort. So we look at American history and we see the massacre at Jamestown. And a direct reaction is that a fort goes up in Plymouth. The harvest of 1622 comes and it is nowhere near the output produced in 1621. Let's have a look at the writing. Chiefly their weakness for want of food prevented them from cultivating it as they should have done. Again, much was stolen before it became eatable, and though many were whipped when they were caught stealing a few ears of corn, hunger drove others to it. So they had two problems going on here. One was they had such a good harvest last year that people 
weren't motivated to plant anything this year. Apparently, they thought the turkeys and the fowl and all that stuff would just show up and the fish would be great and they'd be fine. And that doesn't happen. And so supplies run short and now people are stealing. And even though people are being punished, they're too hungry to care and they're still stealing. And so now we're watching Plymouth go from well on its way and things doing well to swinging back almost almost overnight to the condition of Jamestown. And uh, Bradford goes on to warn of possible famine. So a big problem uh, possibly coming. A ship arrives from England and trades beaver fur to the colonists, which in turn helps them get corn from the natives. So the trade play gets the Plymouth colonists some relief. Meanwhile, uh, Thomas Weston leaves for Virginia and leaves his brother-in-law, Richard Green, in charge of his new colony. And the Plymouth Pilgrims don't really know much about what's going on there except for some pieces and movements. But uh, as we've learned from earlier, Richard Green does not appear to be a good individual either. And so, uh, not sure what Weston was doing in Virginia, but uh, he does uh, make a habit of Virginia later on. Bradford notes that Weston's men squander their supplies and request corn from the pilgrims. Oh, no. The pilgrims agree to sail around Cape Cod and head down the coast to trade for corn but the weather ends up preventing them from getting around the Cape. And so you've got this Weston group. They are essentially, it's starting to look like freeloading off of the Pilgrims. They ask the Pilgrims for help. The Pilgrims decide they're going to get on a boat and sail around the Cape and try to trade, and then the weather stops them. And while you don't hear about this trip, amongst many historians, it leads to a tragic event. Let's have a look at the writings. Here, Squanto fell ill of Indian fever, bleeding much at the nose, which Indians take for a symptom of death, and within a few days he died. He begged the governor to pray for him, that he might go to the Englishman's God in heaven and bequeathed his things to some of his English friends. His death was a great loss. So Squanto dies, and it is, it is a great, great loss for the Plymouth Pilgrims. But if Weston doesn't show up, does Squanto die? It seems like Weston's arrival has led to a trigger of events that have created challenges, not to mention the Pilgrims' own supply and food issues as well. And I wouldn't be surprised, even though Bradford, in the writing, throws the trip around the Cape on Weston's men, the Pilgrims needed corn as well, so they were probably going on their own accord too. Over the winter, Richard Green, that's Thomas Weston's brother-in-law, dies, and a man by the name of John Sanders is placed in charge of the Massachusetts Bay Colony there, Weston's Colony. Sanders reaches out to William Bradford in February of 1623, requesting help as the natives have refused to trade with their colony and they are starving. Sanders wants Bradford and the Pilgrims to help attack the natives to retrieve supplies. And it sounds like a, a, just a, a play out of the Jamestown uh, playbook. And so you could see things slowly escalating into tragic events. But Bradford and the Pilgrims refuse to help Sanders and ask that he not attack them. So Bradford and the Pilgrims are holding true to their alliance. They're being faithful in their alliance. But Weston's crowd is starving. They're a different kind of people. They are not 
Puritans or Puritan separatists. And unfortunately, despite Bradford's efforts and the Pilgrims' efforts, the damage is already done. Rumors begin to swirl amongst the natives that the Pilgrims are going to steal corn by force and that the Weston colony and their actions were being associated back to the Plymouth Pilgrims. So it's one of these things like one Englishman does something wrong and it must be all Englishmen that are doing it. All Englishmen are bad. All of these colonists are bad. And so Weston's colony has really put a strain on these relationships. And sadly, uh, the trouble is just beginning for the Plymouth Pilgrims. And we're going to talk more about this next time on Historical Context. <laughs>